Hello, and welcome to episode 12 of St. Luke's Gallery. This is part two of my series on sacred art in the land of Rus, from the dawn of Christianity to the present day. If you're new to St. Luke's Gallery, you may want to check out part one first, as it presented an overview of the history of Rus and how Christianity came to be in that region. For your convenience, there's a link to part one in the show notes. With part one, we left off with some great examples of sacred icons from the 12th century. Today, we'll pick up where we left off and go a little further into the 16th century. So without delay, let's dive right in. In part one, we looked at some of the examples from the schools of iconography in some of the key cities of Kiev and Rus, focus, focusing on some fine examples from Novgorod, Vladimir, Suzdal, and we ended with a couple from Yaroslavl and Rostov. Let's start off with picking up with two additional icons of our Lord from Yaroslavl, both dating back to the 13th century. On the left, Christ the Pantocrator. This is a style of our Lord dating back to the early days of Greek iconography. Pantocrator means almighty or all powerful and can also be translated into ruler of all. The later translation is why versions of the Pantocrator are so often found on the ceilings of Eastern Rite churches. Christ the Pantocrator is illustrated above, subtly communicating that he is the ruler of all below. On the right is the Mandelion. So, what on earth is a Mandelion? It's a fascinating story dating back to the year 384 in Edessa, which is in Upper Mesopotamia. There, a miraculous icon of Jesus appeared on a square piece of cloth following the king of Edessa's request for our Lord to cure him of an illness. He was given the name Mandelion in the Eastern Orthodox churches and is considered, along with the Vale of Veronica, to be the earliest of religious icons. Both of these are from the Yaroslavl school and they have similarities, such as the style of the eyes and the integration of the cross into the halo, but also are quite different in their individual executions. The Mandelion in particular has Christ looking more like a man of Rus, with the light skin, the narrow nose, and the small lips as compared with Christ the Pantocrator, and that one is closer to the icons attributed back to Constantinople. Both of these are fine examples of 13th century icons, and as you can see, both have been preserved very well over the centuries. Egg tempera paints, despite being rather delicate to work with, do have incredible longevity once they dry and are sealed with linseed oil. Continuing on with Yaroslavl, here are two examples of the elusive style of icons that some of you may be familiar with from episode 5, which focused on the icon of Our Lady of Vladimir, and in the show notes there will be a link to that episode as well. On the left is the 13th century Theotokos of Kashin, which was originally in the St. Demetrius Monastery in Kashin. On the right, the 14th century Theotokos of Tolga, originally in the Tolga Monastery, and now in Moscow's Tretryov Gallery. The Kashin icon is almost identical composition-wise to Our Lady of Vladimir, but the style is very, very different. It reminds me of the icons one sees in Coptic churches. The Tolga icon is certainly much more elaborate and has some similarities to the Novgorod style, the eyes of Our Lord and Our Lady especially. The Tolga icon is attributed to Theophanes the Greek. He was, as his title implies, a Greek iconographer who came to Rus and would later become the teacher and mentor of Andrei Rublev, whose works we'll see in this episode a little bit later. Shifting back for a minute to the 12th century, here is a mosaic of St. Demetrius that was installed in Kiev's St. Michael's Gold Dome Monastery by Siatopolok II to glorify the patron saint of his father. It goes without saying that the Greek influence is heavy in this execution. And now we move on to the school of Belozirk, with two 13th century icons residing today in St. Petersburg State Russian Museum. The Theotokos of Belozirk on the left, again, takes on the elusive style most commonly associated with the Vladimir icon, but here she's definitely unique to Belozirk. Note the color red in the halos and the color blue on the border, both of which are colored choices that are almost never seen with icons. Gold tends to be the standard for both halos and for borders. 
On the right, Saints Peter and Paul adopt a style of full-length figures that would become more and more common in this region as opposed to the earlier, more portrait icons of Greece. This one has been touched up, if not largely repainted over the years. And looking at it carefully, note how St. Peter's face on the right is literally split in two. I'm going to assume that the left side of his face is the original in that it does look a bit older. Note the strong reddish color in the face, which like the use of red on the Theotokos icon's halo is unusual. Also of note on this one is the small inset of Our Lord between the two saints at the very top. The most apt touch this unknown icon of the inserted. I'm going to spend some time now on the works of Andrei Rublev, who is hands down the most famous of Russian iconographers. Very little is known about Rublev's life, and there aren't any portraits of him. The image you're seeing here is one of his icons of Christ the Redeemer. It is believed that he was born in the 1360s and lived at some point in the Trinity Lavra of St. Sergius Monastery, seven kilometers to the northeast of Moscow. The first historical mention of him was in the year 1405 when he wrote the icons and frescoes for the Cathedral of the Annunciation in Moscow's Kremlin with Theophanes the Greek, who wrote the Theotokos of Tolga icon we just saw. Theophanes the Greek, as I mentioned earlier, is believed to have been Rublev's teacher and mentor. Rublev co-wrote the Assumption Cathedral in Vladimir and the Trinity Lavra Cathedral of St. Sergius in the early to mid 1400s. But he went on to write the frescoes in Moscow's Adronikov Monastery where he died sometime between 1427 and 1430. Rublev inspired many iconographers in the centuries to come and was eventually canonized by the Russian Orthodox Church in 1988. Although very little is known about his life, the 1966 film of his namesake by the Russian filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky is a worthwhile watch. The film is most unusual because Russia was part of the atheistic Soviet Union in 1966, and films about Christianity were all but non-existent, and certainly films that linked Christianity with the history of Russia. Here are two of Rublev's works from Moscow's Cathedral of the Annunciation. The very aptly titled The Annunciation on the left and The Nativity of Jesus on the right, both from the year 1405. The Annunciation is a familiar sight in both the Catholic and the Orthodox churches, and there have been thousands of depictions over the centuries. There's a nice triangular composition here with the Archangel Gabriel on the left, Our Lady on the right, and up above at the top, if you look carefully, there's a hand within what looks to be a red mantle that's holding three rays of light which are pointing directly to the Blessed Father's halo. The Nativity is quite illustrative, with the extended story of the Nativity to include not only the birth of Jesus, but also the visitation of the angels, the shepherds, and the Magi. Note how the Blessed Father is reposing on a red mantle, which may or may not be linked to the mantle above her in the Annunciation. Shifting forward a few years to 1408. These are three of Rublev's works that were created for Vladimir's Dormition Cathedral. In the center, the Savior enthroned in glory, also known as Christ in majesty. On the left, St. Gregory the Theologian, and on the right, St. Andrew the First Called. You can see here with these and the previous examples that Rublev has taken the icon and developed his own style, but at the same time, the basics that were always there, starting with the Greeks, and then to the schools of Novgorod, Vladimir, and Yaroslavl, etc., are still there. I know it's hard to see, but the text and the sacred scripture our Lord is holding is in Slavonic, rather than Greek as it depicted in much older icons. This is a photo of the interior of the Dormition Cathedral in Vladimir. You can see the original frescoes, some of which are attributed to Rublev in the foreground arch, before the later icons, leading towards the beautiful iconostasis under the dome. And this is the interior of the Annunciation Cathedral in Moscow. Note Christ the Pantocrator above in the interior dome, the ruler of all looking down below. Frescoed and paneled icons, as seen in this and the prior example, serve two purposes, veneration and catechism, especially in the early days of the church. A totally illiterate person could enter a church like this in the 14th century and receive a bit of visual catechism while attending the Divine Liturgy. 
back to some individual works by Andrei Rublev. We just entered the Easter season, and in a few weeks we'll celebrate the Ascension. And here are two more works from Rublev, showing the harrowing of hell on the left when our Lord freed the souls at Limbo after the crucifixion. On the right, the Ascension shows our Lord departing this world. Note the two angels behind Our Lady, pointing the apostles to look up, while below, she extends her hand to one of the apostles. Those are executional touches that I have not seen before in non-Orthodox depictions of the Ascension. The same for Christ depicted with angelic wings, as he is in the icon of the harrowing of hell. What you're looking at here is one of Rublev's most famous icons, if not his most famous. The Trinity is believed to date to 1411 and was commissioned to honor St. Sergia of Adonisia of the Trinity Lava Monastery near Moscow. You may be wondering, why doesn't the Trinity show a depiction of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? And that is definitely a fair question. The Trinity in this case depicts the three angels who visited Abraham at the Oak of Mamre from the Old Testament. In that chapter of Genesis, Abraham was sitting at the door of his home in the heat of the day by the Oak of Mamre and saw three men standing in front of him, who in the next chapter were revealed to be angels. When he saw them, Abraham ran from the door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth. Abraham then ordered a servant boy to prepare a choice calf and to set curds, milk, and the calf before them, waiting on them under a tree as they ate. One of the angels told Abraham that his wife Sarah would soon give birth to a son. And here we see the three angels sitting down at the dinner table while Abraham's house, the oak tree, and Mount Moriah are in the background. Getting back to the question of the icon's name, the Trinity received various interpretations throughout time, but by the 19th to the 20th century, the consensus among the scholars was that the three angels who visited Abraham represented the Christian Trinity, one God and three persons. Executional-wise, there is a circle formed with the three angels' bodies at the table, and if you look at their faces, one looks at another who looks at the other, thus a circular infinity motion is formed to stress the trinity of three and one. And here's a close-up of the angels' faces. The trinity resides today in Moscow's Tretyakov Gallery. I'm going to end this episode with the icon of Our Lady at Kazan, and it's a fascinating and mysterious story. What you're looking at is not the original. This is a copy believed to date to the 16th century. The original Kazan icon was acquired from Constantinople and may have been written by St. Luke. It was, and still is, a beloved icon of the Russian Orthodox Church, representing the Virgin Mary as the protector and patroness of the city of Kazan, as well as all of Rus. According to the legend, the icon was lost in the year 1438 and it was recovered 140 years later in excellent condition. After a fire destroyed the city of Kazan, the Virgin is said to have appeared to a 10-year-old girl revealing the location of the icon. The girl told her archbishop, but he didn't believe her. Therefore, the girl and her mother recovered the icon on their own, finding it buried under the ruins of a house where it had been hidden to save it from the Tartar invaders. Copies were made in varying styles and were enshrined in several churches, including the Kazan cathedrals of Moscow, Yaroslavl, and St. Petersburg. In the 17th and 18th centuries, Russian military commanders credited the Virgin's assistance in repelling the Polish invasion of 1612, the Swedish invasion of 1709, and Napoleon's infamous winter invasion of 1812 through veneration of the Kazan icon. In 1904, the icon was stolen from the Kazan convent of Theotokos and is believed to have been destroyed. The 16th century copy you see here was purchased by the Blue Army of Fatima in 1970, where it was enshrined in Fatima, Portugal until 1993. The icon was then given by the Blue Army to the Vatican. In 2004, Pope John Paul II gave the icon to the Russian Orthodox Church, and it is today enshrined in the Cathedral of the Elevation of the Holy Cross, built on the site where the original icon of Kazan was discovered. And that concludes episode 12 of St. Luke's Gallery. In a couple of weeks, part 3 of the series will be up, 
Until then, please visit stlukesgallery.com and also the channels on BitChute, Vimeo, Rumble, or YouTube. Questions or comments can be sent to mail at stlukesgallery.com. Thank you again, and may God bless you.